Okay, so uh, my presentation is called You Might Not Need a CRDT. Uh, you do not need to know what a CRDT is to, know the, to get this presentation, so don't worry if you're already lost. We'll get there. Um, but basically, this kind of stemmed out of a couple things. Um, I was spending a lot of time talking to people who were building multiplayer apps and uh, apps that needed kind of uh, state synchronization tech. And I was also reading a lot of Hacker News comments, and I realized that on Hacker News, everybody thinks that everybody else is using a CRDT. And then I would talk to these people, and they would all say, I read a paper or two on CRDTs, and we looked at a CRDT library, and we decided to just do this dumb thing instead. And we're at 10,000 users now when it works. And so this talk is really about like what that thing often is that works when they have 10,000 users, and why CRDTs are not all that. Um, but I'll, I'll put some praise on CRDTs in here, too, because they're actually really cool tech. Um, so a little background on me. I'm Paul. Uh, I co-founded a company called Jamsocket. We build essentially scaled out WebSocket infrastructure. So if you're building an app and you want to have um, lots of WebSocket sessions that each have their own process backing them uh, that kind of spin up and down on demand on the fly, that's kind of what we do. And that's why I spend a lot of time talking to people building multiplayer, because um, they tend to use WebSockets these days. Um, but before we had WebSockets and before we had browsers and before we had uh, the internet, applications looked something like this, uh, and particularly this save dialog when you, when you kind of decided that your picture was done and you wanted to hang it on the fridge, you would go file save, you would kind of save this file, and you'd have this physical artifact in some cases, you could, you could actually drag this file onto a plastic save icon and then you'd have something you could actually hold in your hand uh, give to somebody else, they would have your file, and all of that. Uh, and then around like 2010, I mean, it, early as 20, uh, 2006, um, you started to see this phase of web-based editors, web-based applications, um, and they kind of changed the mode. And I think a lot of people, when they see this, or at the time, you know, the things that people got excited about was multiplayer. Like, I could see what you're doing. But I think even more fundamentally, these kind of represented this shift of kind of things by applications being like share by value uh, to being share by reference. And I intentionally mean this kind of as a nod to how programming languages talk about pass by value and pass by reference semantics. Um, if I share something by value, whether it's a variable or whether it's a rich text file format, I guess, uh, I give it to you. You can make changes to it. I don't see those changes unless you send them back. And if I make changes, you don't see them. Um, when I share by reference, when I share a URL to some document, you're seeing that document update. And I think this has actually had a really profound effect on how we think about and how we develop, uh, and really just the implications on the application developer for data structures that we use for storing state and program state and document state in an application. Um, so in the, in the kind of file system way, we have this share by value apps. Um, the application's kind of responsible for, you know, saving documents to disk, to keeping some in-memory representation, rendering that document as pixels on the screen. And then everything else, you know, managing versioning. Uh, if, if I go back here, you know, I've got these file one, two, three. Uh, this is Windows 3.1, so you could actually only use eight characters for the file name plus the extension. Um, you know, that, that kind of fell on the user. Uh, resolving concurrent changes fell on the user. Controlling who got to access the document was literally who you hand that floppy disk to uh, or who you emailed that file to. So these were kind of out of the application's control, out of the application's responsibility. And when we move to this shared by reference world, the application kind of becomes responsible for all of that. Um, and that's, that's kind of where I think that's kind of like how we got to where we are. A lot of people see this sort of explosion of, of CRDTs and stuff as a result of COVID and we're all working remotely, but I think it really dates back to this sort of 2010 era shift that we've seen happen. Um, and so I want to get into kind of the, the technical bits of like why this is different. Um, so an application like Word, for example, can have this autosave loop, um, or like, let's say a vector editor, because that's what I've chosen here. So uh, it, you load up the application, it can pull some, you know, scoop up that document, load it into program memory. 
then as it goes, every time you edit, it, it can start a timer, maybe every 10 seconds or something uh, that there's edits, it will dump that back to disk. And you notice this, once it loads it up, this is actually just one way. It, it never has to kind of reload that state from disk. Uh, this is sort of a you know, simple, ex simple example um, where you assume that the, the program kind of has a lock on that file. Uh, and then even before browsers were really part of the picture, if you had like a network file, or file system or something like that, I think a network file system is actually an example of the pass by or the share by reference type of uh, editing because you kind of, you're referring to something on a shared, uh, a shared state that you both access. So in that case, you kind of have this kind of textbook race condition, right? Where Bob can load this after Alice has loaded it. Alice has made a save. Bob loaded before that save hit. Bob makes another change. And this might be an independent change. Bob's moving this circle and adding a stroke. Uh, Alice has only changed the color. So these things shouldn't class, but they, they do because this system is only aware of state. It does not have any sort of first class representation of what those changes are. Um, there's a number of solutions to this and they all really boil down to this kind of core idea that you need a way to have this first class kind of representation of the mutations or the operations uh, or diffs. Um, but they're kind of these localized changes. Uh, a good example of this is something like git. Um, when you git patch or git merge, you can merge onto uh, a branch that has had changes since you pulled. And that is entirely because git has this kind of compact, localized representation of those diffs. Um, in this example, it's a little bit different where instead of diffs, we're kind of representing an operation. Uh, I kind of see those as two sides of a similar coin. Um, but even this does not guarantee any sort of consistency. Um, and this becomes apparent quickly as you kind of get into more complex state. Uh, so this is an example where, so if I go back, uh, I've had you know, set color, set position. They're sort of implying that there's just one shape. Now we've got a list of shapes. It's kind of implicit here, but you can kind of figure out what's going on. When I push a shape, it's pushing it to some list. Uh, when I remove a shape, it's removing it by index in that list. And what's happened here is that even though Alice got, Alice and Bob got the same set of operations, they got those operations in a different order. And as a result of that, at this time where uh, they, what appears on screen is correct or is, is, is the same in both cases, their, their underlying data representation is different. And so this remove shape does a different thing. So I think this is kind of fundamental what it comes down to. So to get consistency, we either need to have our mutations be commutative or to have a, global, uh, a globally ordered state. So like a, everybody sees the operations in the same way. Um, I think basically these are like the two paths that you can take. Um, so the first path is let's say everything gets a commutative mutation. That mostly corresponds with CRDTs. There's a, it's, it's like a touch hand wavy here, but like, I think if you build your intuition on this, you'll, you'll be directionally right. Um, number two, where you're kind of creating a global order over those mutations, uh, I call it state machine synchronization. Um, it's similar vein to event sourcing. Um, there's a couple other names for it, uh, but this is another one that I wanna talk about. So I'm, I'm mostly gonna focus on the first two. But for the sake of mentioning it, there's a third option here, which is that you can have a central authority that knows the state of every client and is able to rewrite mutations as they come in so that that client gets the right thing. Um, this is as tricky as it sounds. It used to be a bigger thing when, when clients were kind of dumber and people didn't wanna put too much work on the client. Um, Google Docs, I believe, still works that way. It certainly did originally. Um, it's called operational transformation. And uh, you don't see it as often these days. I don't necessarily know that it, it got a fair shake, but because um, it is some, some cool stuff. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna talk about it in this talk. Um, and so going back actually to, to CRDTs here. So one of the reasons that CRDTs are really appealing is that they reduce the problem of synchronizing state to the problem of synchronizing an append-only set. And it turns out that an append-only set is a really nice data structure to synchronize. 
And that's because you don't need a central authority. Um, so you can use kind of a simple whisper protocol where you're kind of sending out these updates. And you know, each of these peers sort of has a different order, but it doesn't really matter because a set is unordered. Um, this is where the hand waviness gets, comes in a little bit because there are some properties to this ordering. It has to be causally ordered if, if people know database stuff. But if that means nothing to you, just ignore it. I don't think it helps with the intuition here. Um, so remember I said the, the function is, the mutation function is um, commutative here. So the implication is that no matter what order these three mutations are seen in, as long as they're all seen by every client, um, then we end up getting the same result. And so that's essentially, you know, that's the intuition for CRDTs. And we've left it pretty abstract, so we, we don't really know yet what this mutation function does. Uh, and there's a couple things that kind of we need to, to know to make this mutation function useful. Um, so one is that even though, even if we get consistency, we don't know if we've preserved intent. And so when I say preserved intent, I just mean that if two users do things and those things conflict, then ideally we would like to choose a CRDT that gives us something that kind of reflects the intent of both of those users. Um, now, it, it may not always be possible to do something that's you know, semantically right in the case of merging text. So in this case, we have, say, Alice and Bob again. Uh, Alice types jumps, uh, Bob types sprints. These are both sort of inserted at the same position in the document. Um, there's a, you know, CRDTs are a family of, of data structures. So there's not just one CRDT. Uh, there's not even just one CRDT for sequences or text. There's lots of CRDTs that you can choose from. Um, and I, I like this as kind of an example of how intent uh, can or cannot be preserved depending on which CRDT you choose. Um, this LC CRDT is a good sequence CRDT for things like to-do lists. Um, where you might want to have sort of prior prioritized rankings and things like that. Um, and you can certainly use it for text in the sense that text is a list, it's a sequence, um, but you obviously get these like this weird interspersion of characters. Uh, whereas something like Yatta, there's a, uh, Yatta is a CRDT used by YJS, if you're familiar with that library, uh, one of the bigger open source CRDT libraries. It will sort of do arguably the right thing here. Uh, I don't think there's a, thing that you could argue is more right. It still looks weird, right? But um, at least it kind of leaves things in, a, things in a state that's gonna be easier for one of Alice and Bob to correct. Um, another thing that, that kind of, so you know, that shows that there's, that there's different CRDTs that preserve intent. Um, you can get CRDTs for arbitrary JSON data structures. And that's where I think there's this trap around preserving intent where uh, I think of it as like the composition trap. So you, it's easy to say, okay, my data structure that I use in my application, my program state or my document state can be represented as JSON. And if I have JSON, I can represent a, data, a JSON data structure as a CRDT. So I should be able to just throw my JSON data structure into a CRDT and then my program is kind of has all these nice properties that the CRDT has. I won't have conflicts and all of that. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't compose that way. It just doesn't, doesn't work. I'm gonna talk about why. Um, and the main thing that I see as the burden here, or the, the main falling point, is this ability to preserve invariance. So not intense anymore. We're talking about actual like, data structure invariance when it comes to correctness. Um, an example where this often comes up is something like a tree. Uh, I've kind of represented this as an abstract kind of tree diagram, but uh, often it comes up if you're sort of doing things like, you know, going back to the, the vector graphics example, you might want to have nested groups. You're, you can have groups of groups. Uh, effectively, that's a tree, and, and effectively, you kind of run into these problems. Um, so this is a very simple representation of, a, of this tree where I have this parent nodes point up. Um, Alice and Bob both get a copy of this, they both make a change. Both of these changes individually preserve the property that this is a tree. Um, when I say the property that's a tree, I mean there's no cycles, every, every node kind of has a path to the root. Uh, and 
we can merge and there's no CRDT conflicts to, to the CRDT. This is actually great. This is, uh, Alice has changed the record for C. Bob has changed the record for B. There's no overlap. It's, uh, you know, easy. Um, but the problem is if we actually kind of represent the tree that that represents, um, there's a cycle. There's no, these nodes are not talking to the root. Uh, and so you end up, in the case of a graphics editor, you might end up with, uh, you've lost everything in that group because you, it's there, but you have no way of, uh, it's, it's not rooted to anything. So this is a, an obvious problem. Um, I'm gonna show you a demo because this is actually, um, we, we did write uh, a tree CRDT, um, but I wanna show you how ugly it is. Uh, let me just make sure that this is, let's do this again. Um, so I've got this, these nodes, I can add this. I'm gonna reparent this, I'm gonna reparent this. Um, and you can see what's actually happening here is that what it has to do is sort of represent the entire history uh, of the parents that it's had. And that's because there's this whole 200 lines of code that's sort of going over this, this data structure, the, this sort of underlying data structure, and then figuring out what, what should have what parent because it needs to kind of go back and and resolve things in such a way, uh, and it might need to kind of go back in time to something's parent to, to actually resolve this. So um, it gets ugly. Um, this particular CRDT, CRDT was actually described by uh, Evan Wallace of Figma. So this is um, not used by Figma, but it is a uh, kind of an experiment that he was looking at or a, a, a version of some algorithms, algorithms that they use that was ported to it. He, he experimented with running it on a CRDT, um, and it is not in production, so that tells you something. Um, so going back to this slide, so we had these two options. We looked at CRDTs. Uh, option number two is this state machine synchronization. Um, th this looks a little bit ugly, uh, but the nice thing about this is this is as complex as state machine synchronization gets, and then once you kind of have this, you can throw in any state machine and you get something that works. Um, so I'm just gonna walk through it kind of temporally here. So at, at version one, I'm gonna, is it still, oh, I'm gonna have to X that out of, out of that so we can see these numbers. Ah, well, you know that two's behind there, okay. So at, at version one, we kind of have this initial state. Um, server down here is obviously the server. Everything above this is a, a data structure on the client. The client has two copies of the state at all times. One is the verified copy, which is sort of the, the best known kind of copy that the server has been in. The, so this is sort of no pending local changes. The optimistic copy is the copy that includes things that we've changed locally. And then the pending stack is those changes that we've made locally. So at time two, somebody else, Alice, adds this uh, yellow triangle. The server's aware of it, um, but so far the server's just sitting on that, maybe it's an event loop doing other things. Uh, at time three on our optimistic copy, Bob adds this green square. Um, so that doesn't touch the verified copy, skips over the verified copy, goes right to the server, this intent, uh, and also gets put in the pending stack. Um, but it's, it, the optimistic copy is kind of what's rendered on screen. Um, so it's pushing that down. The server now confirms this, so it's here. And, but the server first has to tell everybody to process yellow. So yellow comes up, yellow because it's coming from the server, goes to the verified copy. Um, the verified copy is then copied to the, over the optimistic copy. So we kind of throw out the old optimistic copy. Uh, we reapply the, from the pending stack. The, this, so even though it hasn't been confirmed yet, we're kind of just reapplying the local intent so that you don't get things jittering. And then, uh, then the server will apply green soon after that. That goes up because we can just pop that off the first thing in the pending stack. We then have an empty pending stack and optimistic and verified copy are uh, in sync again. Um, so that's, that's kind of neat if you can do it. Uh, one challenge to this is that it kind of relies on this naive assumption that you have two clients and one server. And in the real world, you kind of have um, you know, you, you have horizontally scaled out architectures and things like that. So 
this is another reason that I think CRDTs have been pretty persistent is that you can use a simple architecture like this and just stick Redis behind it and these servers are essentially peers in that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, exchange that we described earlier. Uh, one solution to this could be you could replace Redis with some sort of raft implementation. You can kind of have something that, um, that kind of creates a global order. Um, another solution that we like is, so we have an open source project called Plane, uh, it's plane.dev, and what it does is instead of running every, every transaction or every message through Raft, it uses, uh, actually we used to use Raft, now we just use Postgres, we use Postgres transaction to uh, kind of schedule individual, um, say documents on a particular server, and then route requests related to that document to the, to the right server. So it's kind of a way of trading, uh, trading some availability for being much lower latency than having every message go through Raft. Um, and how am I on time? Doing good? Okay. Um, I just wanna show a, a quick demo oops, of what, uh, what a state machine based app can look like. So this is actually something that I, I made during the pandemic. So this was like, this is a couple years old now. And it was when we were first, um, <coughs> first sort of playing, uh, you know, getting used to Zoom. And I was playing stuff with my family and decided to make a word game. Um, so I, I'll just show you how this works first. Let's say, uh, And then over here, I'll play, there. Uh, bring up the, I should have done this first time, just look at this. So um, what this has done is it has sent some initial state. Uh, and then when I make some changes over here, it's just making, uh, basically it's, it's running the same state machine on both the client and the server and the other client. And so every time, even when I click a letter, all it's doing is saying this letter has been selected or this letter has been unselected. The play button has been hit, things like that. Um, so it's actually just running this WebAssembly module on both clients and it's running the same WebAssembly module on the server. Um, even things like the random letter draws, actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a bit closer what's, what's happening here. So, the state here uh, will include, somewhere, will include the seed. Yeah, random state. So this includes like the actual random state uh, of the random number generator. And because it's all run in WebAssembly, it's all deterministic. So even the random letter draws are, uh, are really just part of the state machine like you just saw there, that was just um, if I go down here, it it's not going to say what letter was drawn because uh, it doesn't need to. It's just going to say there was this transition um, time exhausted. So, uh, but the, the client sort of sees that transition, uh, runs the random number generator, and it just makes sure that it gets the same value as the server because it's just deterministic. Um, yeah. So I don't have a summary slide, but I wanna kind of summarize the things that I've talked about. So, um, so we've seen a lot of people kind of reflexively think that CRDTs are, the, are like associated with multiplayer. And so if there's any takeaway, I want you to think <laughs> that's not always the case. Um, CRDTs are really cool. It's really cool that you can kind of go from this, um, this commutative set of operations or this sort of unordered set of operations and get something that's consistent across machines on it. Um, and state machines are kind of the, I don't know, my favorite thing. Um, you can just send messages back and forth and as long as they're the same on every machine and it's a deterministic operation, you get the same thing. And I think that's, it's super powerful and I think that there's, um, there's like cohorts of, of software engineering that have discovered that. There's a lot of people who are like big on the event sourcing side and all that. But I think just when it comes to this multiplayer stuff, it's almost underexplored. Um, and I'll just pull up my, my final slide here. Um, yeah, so thanks to everybody for this. Um, 
as Phil mentioned at the beginning, we are doing actually in two weeks to the day, we're doing this, uh, the next browser tech meetup. Um, there's more information on that on the site. Uh, the slides are online, and I guess the recording will be online, so that won't matter as much. But um, and yeah, you can email me. We're we're a rust, a small rust shop in the city, and we'll likely be growing a little bit this year. So if you're a rust engineer, uh, it'd be good to get to know you. Thanks. <laughs>